Thank you very much. It's a real, oh, we need to switch over, don't we? Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. As many of the speakers have been noting, we don't have anything comparable to this undergraduate conference in the United States or in Europe. So uh, this is a special opportunity for us. Today I'm going to talk about, today I'm going to talk about my new book, which is what you've seen right here, and it was published in June. So this is truly a new book. This has not been out for very long. And my understanding is that it's not, it's not being delivered. A few people have ordered it in Korea, but it has not been delivered yet in Korea. But you should see it within a, a few weeks if any of you are interested in it. This book is really far reaching, and it's going to go way beyond robotics today, because it really covers the whole breadth of emerging technology. I wrote this book to be both a primer and introduction to the many fields known as emerging technologies, with a little bit of the science and the history, but I particularly stress what can go wrong and what will be the societal impact of these technologies and how we might address those. So I think what's going to happen here, many of you are going to realize you don't even know what many of these fields of research are. And, that's, and you are not alone in that. That has nothing to do with you being undergraduates or anything. There are genomic experts and robotic experts in your universities who don't necessarily know much about these other fields of research. The title of the book came from this quote from a Norwegian peace activist in the 1920s, Christian Los Lange. And he said, the technology is a good servant but a dangerous master. And I juxtaposed this with another quote from uh, an American comedian uh, way back before most of you were born, Professor Owen Corey. And he said, if we don't change direction soon, we'll end up where we're going. So the idea behind writing this book is that we actually need a bit of a course correction, let's say a little bit more STS in the development of emerging technologies. And if we don't make that course correction, I think we will turn technology into a dangerous master rather than keeping it our good servant. If you just listen to the techno-optimists, you would believe we are on a highway to heaven on earth, and the buses are speeding up at an exponential rate. On the other hand, if you listen to the techno-pessimists, we're clearly going to hell in a handbasket, and very quickly. But for most of us, for most of us, technology is a source of both promise and productivity. But there's also a lot of disquiet out there about certain developments in technology and about the collective course of technological development. And that disquiet has been evident in a worldwide prohibition on human cloning. There's a lot of anxiety or problems around human growth hormones in sports and cheating going on in sports. In the European Union, they had a debate about genetically modified foods. They're basically against them. In the US, there's been a debate over the use of embryonic stem cells for research. Some people are for it, some people are against it. There's also in many countries now all this concern around biosecurity, around infosecurity, around toxicity of nanoparticles, about terrorists perhaps creating new organisms that would be pathogenic. And most recently, if you've been following the press, there have been two stories that have been running. One is about CRISPR, a new technology for editing genes that can speed up the rate at which the genes can be edited. So it should speed up synthetic biology in general, and the other one has been a lot of stories about AI safety, a lot of concern recently about whether or not we actually may be able to have AI systems that will exceed human intelligence, and whether they could actually be a danger to us rather than uh, a good servant. Many people I talk to feel that there's nothing they can do about it. Technology is just coming, and it's, you know, Corporations are going to push it. We want it because it's going to create jobs. There's just a certain inevitability in this whole movement. And uh, even if they don't like everything that's taking place, there's nothing they can do about this inevitability. I've used cars. This is an earlier version of, the, of a Google car than the one that was being shown in by a first speaker. 
but I've used self-driving cars as a metaphor for this concern. And the concern is largely that technology is moving into the driver's seat as the primary determinant of your destiny, of humanity's destiny. And do we really want that? In what sense do we want that? What is it of technology that we want? What benefits do we really want to realize? And are there things we just wouldn't like to occur? And do we have, will we have a voice in it? Or how can we have a voice in it? So in this talk, I'm going to start with a prediction that I make very early on, actually in the beginning of the second chapter of this book. <clears throat> I'm going to give you the reasons for my prediction, and then I'm going to talk about inflection points, re engineering for responsibility, and I'm finally going to finish up with some policy recommendations. So here, here's a list of the emerging technologies. I would imagine, well, why don't you take a quick look at it and see how many of those sciences you know about. Anybody think they know what more than five of, of those groups listed are? You don't have to raise your hand, but some of you will. But I imagine there's nobody in this room who knows what all those sciences are, or very few of you in this room who know what all these sciences are. There are many ways to parse the emerging technologies. I just happen to like this grouping of three, starting out with biotechnologies and then technologies that alter the physical and material sciences, and then finally the information sciences, which are perhaps those that are best known to all of us. So here's my prediction. My prediction is that social disruption, public health and economic crises, environmental damage, and personal tragedies, all made possible by the adoption of new technologies, will increase dramatically over the next 20 years. Now, that doesn't mean that all the benefits that are being talked about from technologies won't be realized. I'm just trying to point out the fact that there are also some real risks here, and there are things that will go wrong. And I'm not making this prediction because I want to stop us from realizing the benefits, and I'm not making this prediction because I want to be seen as a prophet in 20 or 30 years. I'm making this prediction in the hopes that People will take the prediction seriously, look at some of the problems we have, and institute measures to, to alleviate those problems, to mitigate those problems, in effect to prove me a false prophet. So, here we go. Unexpected disasters occur when we fail to address the challenges inherent in managing new technologies and complex systems. I put this warning up here on the screen because for those of you who have delicate sensibilities, it may be difficult to look at the next slide. But from thalidomide babies to the explosion of a chemical plant in Bhopal, India, from nuclear meltdowns in Chernobyl and Fukushima to a near meltdown in Three Mile Island. In the US, we had a big oil spill, the Gulf oil leak. And there have been oil leaks in other countries. There were certain gas attacks in Tokyo. And all of us are still experiencing the aftermath of a worldwide recession that was set in motion by real estate derivatives. Real estate derivatives that were largely used to serve the purposes of greedy bankers, but the fact is they couldn't have done what they did without relying on the technology. And once the real estate collapse took place, the derivatives hit the worth of all these banks. So even the owners of the banks, even the presidents of the banks, had no idea what their banks were worth. And that was all due to technology, or at least technology was complicit in all of that. So here are my three reasons why I think we're going to see an increase in disasters over the coming decades. The first is an increasing reliance on complex systems that we don't fully understand and can't fully predict. The second is this accelerating pace of innovation in a climate where oversight lags far behind the innovation. And the third is harms associated with specific technologies. So let me go through each of these a little bit. Complexity is a C word. We live in a world of complex systems. In fact, from a certain perspective, every organism is a complex system. Markets are complex systems. Societies are complex systems. Industries are complex systems. And these complex systems tend to adapt to things around them. Complex adaptive systems, their behavior can be quite unpredictable.
they have tipping points when they restructure or organize themselves into very different forms. If you put, if you kept dropping a sand on a pile, at some point, one additional sand would form a collapse and the pile would restructure itself in a different form. That's what a tipping point is. Or a tipping point is when a rumor suddenly goes and expands and everybody knows it. It's no longer just a rumor that a few people know. And complex systems have emergent properties. They have properties that cannot quite be explained by the individual aspects of the system. So oftentimes when we talk about emergent, tech, emergent properties, we talk about the brain, which is a complex system made up of, of billions of neurons. But none of those neurons in and of itself is conscious, is able to sit in this room and listen to me and engage together with me over thinking through these grand ideas. And yet, each of you here is conscious. Consciousness is often talked about as emergent property, but there are also technological systems that have emergent properties. And complex systems are poorly understood. We do have sciences of complexity. There's a new, fields, new fields coming into being of how you might engineer complex systems so they could be more reliable, so they could be better understood, sometimes called resilience engineering. But most observers think they're difficult, perhaps impossible, to fully control or fully manage. So that's one of my concerns. Furthermore, we live in a world of systems within systems within systems, and there are feedback loops between these systems. So, for example, an economy has so many different components to it that it's very hard to predict what will happen to it because one change may be compensated by or by many different changes in other parts of the system. Complex systems fail, and they fail for five different reasons. The first is incompetence or wrongdoing. So, incompetence was actually a factor in the meltdown at, uh, in, the, in the nuclear meltdown in Chernobyl. There were things that were just managed very poorly. There can be design flaws or vulnerabilities. That's another reason why complex systems fail. So let me give you an example of that. The internet is a complex system that has built-in design flaws. It's not that the intention was to have design flaws, but to make the internet so flexible that when any component failed, it would continue to operate. When any one node went down, messages would find new ways to, to track themselves. That built in an, a vulnerability into the internet that we see being exploited all the time by hackers and by viruses. Another example of a, uh, of a design flaw or vulnerability was uh, the Fukushima nuclear power plants. They were built making an estimation at a height based on, on um, tsunamis, looking at the past few hundred years of the history of tsunamis, but they didn't go far back enough because in the year roughly 970 or so, there was a tsunami that was comparable to the one that flooded Fukushima. So it was designed poorly wasn't fully thought through what the, what the circumstances might be. Then the third reason this complex systems fail are what we refer to as normal accidents. Normal accidents are circumstances where nobody did anything wrong. So at the nuclear meltdown at Three Mile Island in America, three components failed simultaneously. And the engineers had looked at putting backup systems for the failure of any one of those components but they never looked at this combination of three. Furthermore, they probably couldn't have looked at that combination of three. If they looked at the combination of, of the failure of any three major components in that system, they would have been looking at combinations that were equal to all the sands on the beaches of the world. So many combinations would be, would be there. So nobody did anything wrong, but there happened to be a circumstance in which the combination of these events created a failure. Related to that is that we underestimate the risks and fail to plan for low probability events. So if I were to sit here and flip a coin and I'd flip three heads and ask you to guess what the seventh flip would be, 
most of you would say that would be a head. It would, would be probably be tails. But the fact is, it's a 50-50 chance whether it would be a head or a tail. But we tend to underestimate the likelihood of these series, for example, happening. In fact, 10 heads will come up roughly once in every 1,024 flips of a coin, a series of 10 heads. So that seems like a very low probability event, but when you think that it's once in every 1,024, that's not so low. It would take you roughly, oh, two and a half hours to flip a coin that often. Now think about a computer that simulates flipping a coin. It, and it flips a coin once every millisecond, meaning a thousand times in a second. It's going to come up with a series of ten heads roughly once every second. And that's even a computer flipping at a very slow pace. So I'm just trying to illustrate to you, we generally underestimate the likelihood of low probability events, but low probability events do occur. And some low probability events some low probability events can have a very high impact. So we've had flash crashes on, on economic markets. We've had all kinds of things that weren't necessarily impossible events. They were just low probability. Nobody had estimated the likelihood that they occurred. And when they occur, they have a, a broad impact. And these Unforeseen low probability high impact events were called by Nassim Taleb black swans. We called them black swans because so if you see a black swan, you'd be surprised. You, know, you don't expect swans to be black, but occasionally they are. In reviewing various tragedies that have happened in the analysis after the fact of why these tragedies happened, in this case it was Three Mile Island and there was also a Challenger space shuttle in America that blew up that was carrying a, a civilian teacher. The popular writer Malcolm Gladwell concluded that we constructed a world in which the potential for high-tech catastrophe is embedded in the fabric of day-to-day -day life. So here's my second reason for thinking we're going to have an increase in things that are going to go wrong. And that's the accelerating pace of discovery and innovation. Some people say it's not only accelerating, but it's accelerating at an exponential pace, meaning it's doubling over and over again, very much like Moore's Law. And based on those estimations, some roboticists are predicting that within maybe 20 or 30 years, the computing power, the computing power that we will have will be comparable to what they estimate based on a computer theory of mind as the computer power of the brain. And at that point, if we organize the computers correctly, we will have computers that will be equal and exceed human intelligence. And the question is, as many science fiction movies pose, will those computer systems be friendly, or in Terminator or Matrix-like fashion, will they be unfriendly to us humans? The scholarly community tends to be very skeptical of these far-flung predictions because they are used to a history of unfulfilled predictions, and they recognize that the complexity of these challenges, creating a computer system that would be comparable to even your, your intelligence, is, you know, is going to be thwarted. The complexity of your minds and realizing that in computers is going to, it's, the very complexity of it is going to thwart easy progress toward those goals. But the actual rate at which technology is developing, that is a central issue for determining the adequacy of our existing oversight mechanisms. Now, I'm on record as your friendly skeptic. I'm skeptical about many of these more science fiction claims, I, but I'm friendly to the Kendo engineering spirit that says remarkable things lie in our, in our future. So, I've represented myself as this friendly skeptic, somebody who's critical of some of the science fiction claims, but I also applaud the ingenuity coming out of our engineers. I don't know what speed technology is really progressing at, whether 
it's really progressing at an exponential rate or not. But exponential rates or not, because of the speed of the development, we are getting this growing gap, sometimes called the pacing gap, between the onset, the implementation of new technologies, and the ability to put in place governance and oversight mechanisms so that they, that we can ensure that they won't be harmful. So here's my third reason. My third reason is just this list of different things that can go wrong with specific technologies. So I mentioned earlier, um, perhaps designer pathogens that a terrorist wants to create out of synthetic biology, or if not created by a terrorist, perhaps just by accident something gets out of the laboratory and has a detrimental effect, either on human health or on the environment. <coughs> And there are these other issues that I think most of you recognize, privacy, safety, the fairness of the distribution, or whether, or whether what will take place is that some new technology will give a significant advantages to those who have access to it while just exacerbating the gap between them and the rest of us. So we are in the midst of what I've referred to as a veritable tech storm. This outpouring of technology from so many different directions, all of which we need to accommodate and adapt. Where a storm, one storm, will nurture plant life. A, continue, a continual and incessant downpour will actually be destructive of plant life. Uh, and this is the concern, whether we can fully embrace and adapt to the technologies that are coming along. But we don't know what technologies are coming along. We don't know what all the possibilities are. Not only that, there's convergences between these different fields of research, which will, which will allow new possibilities that most of us can't even conceive of today. So how are we going to manage all this uncertainty? Well, in the 1980s, there was a theorist named David Collingridge who looked at the problem of whether we could control the development of technology, the social control of technology. And he recognized that it was the easiest to control the development early on. The problem is, early on, you don't necessarily know how a technology is going to develop. You don't know what all the possibilities are. And some of your estimations may be wrong. But by the time you begin to recognize the social impact of a technology, and its undesirable consequences are recognized, well, it may be too late. The technology may be so embedded in the fabric of the society that you really can't. It becomes very difficult to alter its course or to, or to control how it continues to develop. But many of us here in the world of STF, of ethics, of responsible innovation, we reject this simplistic binary way of looking at technological development. And we're looking for that space between the early development and when you begin to recognize the problems and before technologies get fully entrenched. I refer to that space as inflection points. So flexion points are windows of opportunity where you can alter the course of a technology for good or bad. But windows may not stay open very long. Sometimes they open and close very quickly. Sometimes they stay open for years. But the point is, if you just alter the course of technological development in any field, even in a minor way early on, you can radically alter where it's going to end up, where, where the destination will be. So if you don't alter it, it's on this course, but if you do alter it just slightly, it may veer to a very different course. So here's a couple examples of inflection points that have occurred over the past decade. The first one is just the simple fact that we have now deciphered the human genome, and that has radically altered the course of human history. So that's an inflection point. But within that, there are secondary inflection points. So for example, in America, we decided that the human genes cannot be patented. That was a secondary inflection point. Another one was a breakout of two serious cases of flu. One bird flu here in Asia, and another swine flu in, in Mexico, and World Health Authorities became concerned that both of these cases of flu could mutate into new forms of flu that would be truly deadly, that would create worldwide pandemics. There was a worldwide flu pandemic in 1970s 
1917 of Spanish flu, a different variety of flu, and it killed roughly 3 to 5 percent of the world population. So the concern over a worldwide pandemic forced the World Health Authorities to radically upgrade their preparedness for the next flu outbreak. Communication so that they would know immediately when new cases of a flu had occurred, means to transport the, uh, the flu virus so that it could be studied by researchers in the, over the world, and if one could find, uh, if one could find a way of a vaccine for the flu, then facilities to produce that vaccine in large numbers, even if those facilities would not be needed in the meantime. That didn't stop us from having another Spanish flu-like outbreak, but what it did do was ensure that the next flu outbreak will be nowhere near as serious. So that's, those are recent inflection points. But here's two inflection points that are just beginning to appear. One is technological unemployment. This was a term that was coined by John Maynard Keynes in the 1930s, and what he was referring to is this long-standing fear that each new technology will rob more jobs than it creates. And yet, for two, and every time there's a new technology, somebody says that's what's going to happen. But for 200 years, it has not happened. In fact, nearly every technology has created more jobs than it robbed. But that fear is being raised again, and some people believe for a variety of reasons. One is increasingly intelligent robots capable of filling more and more human jobs, and the other the fact that we are living longer and longer and retiring later, that those are both functioning as repressing job growth and wage growth. In fact, wage growth has been more abundant in most of the world for most workers for roughly 40 years. It varies from country to country whether it's 20 years or 40 years, or 40 years in countries like America. I know that you have a problem now with 20-year-olds finding jobs. From what I read is when I was uh, flying over here, that 70 percent of 20-year of those in their 20s are having difficulties finding jobs. And that's not all due to technological unemployment, but technological unemployment may be a factor in keeping job growth down and it may very well be a factor in expanding how many jobs, in, in contracting how many jobs are available over, um, over future decades. In fact, by some estimates, as much as 45% of jobs today are subject to some form of computerization. But even if it's only 20%, and 20% of those jobs get computerized every year, that's 1% working population that gets taken away from humans and made available to, to machines instead. Here's another, here's another inflection point we're dealing with. The roboticization of warfare. Is this a good idea or is it a recipe for future ex disasters? A lot of people have been, become concerned about this and many of you may be aware that there's already a worldwide campaign to, campaign to ban lethal autonomy, to ban the use of robotic weaponry that can both pick and kill targets on its own without immediate and direct human involvement in that decision making. And many people are, are jumping onto that campaign. But it's not clear whether robots are the kind of weapons that you can really ban by traditional arms control agreement. Think of the simple fact that if you sent inspectors in to look at these devices, well, the difference between one that's autonomous and not autonomous may be, in, be merely a question of a few lines of code or a switch that got added to the system five minutes after the inspector leaves. But consider the fact that we already have autonomous weapons that are being used for defensive purposes, and all you would have to do is turn them in the other direction, they become offensive. I know that you have, on the, in the DMZ, you have a bunch of systems developed by Samsung, the Samsung Techwinds, that actually can autonomously take out anything that moves within the DMZ. Or at least we understand that there, there may be an autonomy mode there where once they're switched on, they will kill whatever animal life or human life tries to cross the DMZ. So this is an example of some systems that already exist. So 
So I'm suggesting that we should propose that machines must not make decisions that result in the death of humans. That that would be mala and se. Now mala and se, this is an ancient Roman term, and it refers to something that's evil in itself. So slavery, 200 years ago, was accepted all around the world. Nobody accepts slavery anymore. Slavery is now seen as a form of evil in itself, something that's mala and se. Rape is seen as mala and se, particularly in, in the context of warfare. Machines making life and death decisions are mala and se, not merely because they are machines, but because their actions are sometimes unpredictable, they don't have full capability for discrimination, they can't be full, fully controlled, and attribution of responsibility is difficult, if not impossible. So we should draw a moral line now about what is and what isn't acceptable. If we don't, Everyone predicts a few years from now we're going to have a robot arms race and humans will not be able to compete because they'll be able to kill you much quicker than you can you can. So there are various ways of, of move, moving forward on this. I present I presented a proposal that might start this from an executive order from the President of the United States, but who knows whether anything like that will happen. But military robots are just the cutting edge of a much broader challenge. And it came up in our lecture earlier this morning. There are many new forms of autonomous robotic systems being developed. And the real ethical problem for all of us is to ensure that those autonomous systems do not undermine the foundational principle that there's a human agent, either individual or corporate, that is responsible and potentially culpable and liable for the actions of these machines. There will be movement to dilute that principle, and that's not something we should want to have happen. We need to maintain responsibility in the hands of someone or something that can be held responsible. So let me go quickly now a few other ways of addressing some of our challenges. We should challenge the assumptions which are drivers of the tech storm. One of the drivers is techno-solutionism, the, the notion that for every problem there will be a technological solution. But a technological solution is not necessarily the best solution. Again, our speaker this morning showed an instance where putting, putting um, explosives on the back of an animal might have been more effective than, than an autonomous weapon. And that's just one simple example of how we should look for the simplest solutions. We shouldn't always look for the technological solution. In your country, in my country, in every country, we have been hearing for decades that technology will lower health care costs. But this has not happened. If anything, technology seems to increase health care costs. That doesn't mean it doesn't increase health care results in some areas. But in other areas, it's more mixed, whether it's increasing health care results. So if you live longer for a deadly, if you're suffering from a deadly disease, such as a deadly cancer, but you're able to live 10 years with that deadly cancer, was that a gift or was that, was that a new burden? That's, these are the kinds of questions we need to deal with. But in America, for example, health care costs are growing at 6 to 8% a year. And all the analysts agree that roughly 50% of that is because of tech, new health care technology. In some cases, the development of totally innovative healthcare technologies, but in many cases, just the dissemination of healthcare technologies that already exist. So, MRI machines now are available in hospitals all over the world. In the US, we are actually spending $3 trillion a year on healthcare. That makes our healthcare budget alone much larger than the gross domestic product of, of Korea. And in fact, the sixth largest economy in the world by itself, an economy larger than that of France, and just a half a trillion dollars less than the powerhouse Germany. And I believe powerhouse Germany is seventh, and I believe Korea is like 11th or 12th in gross domestic product. So we're talking about a tremendous amount being spent on health care. And, and yet, we get less bang for our health care buck than most countries in the world. So, yeah, thank you. In the US, we now spend 70% of our gross domestic product on health care, and it will be one-fifth of the country's economy by the end of 
the end of this decade. That's an unsupportable situation. Another thing we should be engaged in is engineering for responsibility. The ethics, law, and societal impact of technologies, research on that should be funded right along with the development of what are seen to be the beneficial technologies. So let me give you a few examples of that. For example, in technologies that have the potential to be dangerous, to do something harmful, we should build in, we should make them eunuchs or build in kill switches, things to stop their behavior if what they do is unacceptable. So for example, we could build, we could have suicide genes. We could have plants that can't reproduce, and therefore they cannot cross-fertilize. They cannot create hybrids with similar plants and destroy the genome of heirloom plant species that we would like to keep. In synthetic, well, I'm not going to go through all of those because I have to explain what some of these sciences are. But various scientists like George Church, he's a very responsible guy who's, who's leading the movement to develop new synthetic organisms, often single-celled organisms, some that could be introduced, for example, into your digestive tract and help fight diseases or maybe help you eat all the mochi that you wanted to without getting sick or chocolate or whatever you desire without putting on weight. But he is also looking at ways to restrain these very same technologies if they might be misused. One of the big science fiction -y fears has been something called gray goo. And that's a fear that comes out of nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is largely about engineering on the molecular and atomic scale. So tiny engineering, and so far it has been largely about creating new materials. But there's also a belief that it could be created, it could be developed in ways to create really tiny little machines, what are called nanomachines. But this gray goo fantasy was put out about a few decades ago. And the basic idea was, what if you created a nanomachine that self-reproduced? All it did was create itself over and over and over again. And it consumed all the basic chlorophyll-based matter, all the carbon-based matter. What would happen? Well, all your green trees and your trees in general would disappear and the earth would be left in a three foot thick sludge of gray goo made up of nothing but zillions of these same little machines that are, that are reproducing. That's a somewhat fanciful possibility, but it's not, it's not impossible. And one suggestion has been that for nanomachines, you have all of them build in a component that would dissolve with a known chemical reaction. So that if they got out of hand, if they started functioning in a way that was harmful to the environment or harmful to human health, you would have a way of destroying, of ending these nanomachines. A big issue with nanotechnology is what happens when humans consume nanoparticles and they get into the bloodstream and they pass the blood-brain barrier. So they could also be detrimental to health. Another suggestion is to embed ethicists and social theorists in the design teams with all engineering design teams. George Church actually has an ethicist embedded in his design team for his synthetic biology in his lab at Harvard. And the idea here is that the ethicists don't become a part of the team as naysayers to say, don't do this, don't do that. They have finger waivers. But they become members of the design team that are sensitive to concerns that perhaps the engineers might otherwise not be sensitive to, so they can build those concerns into the very new products that they build, that they build ways of dealing with those concerns with the new products. And we can make responsibility itself a design component. So right now, so right now engineers are, are they have all kinds of specifications for the product. Make it light, make it run on very little energy, or make that product so it doesn't overheat. Well, why not tell them when you make the product, also think through who will be responsible if the product fails. And if you make that part of your design specification, then we will keep somebody responsible in the loop. But we also might look at very different platforms than we would build systems on other ones. 
And then there is this question of moral machines or machines capable of making moral decision making. So many of you may already know my previous book, which I co-authored with my colleague here, Colin Allen, Moral Machines Teaching Robots Right from Wrong. It's about a new field which is known as machine morality and machine ethics. By the way, it is also available in Korean, for those of you who have difficulty reading English. And it's not about house training your robot, your robocat, but it is about implementing moral decision-making faculties in artificial edge agents. And it's been necessitated by autonomous systems making choices, taking actions for good or, or bad that could be harmful to humans or the environment. And there are many questions that inform this field. Do we need artificial moral agents? When, for what? Do we want machines making ethical decisions? The age-old problem, whose ethics or whose morality gets implemented in these machines? And then finally, can, can we or how can we make ethics computable? Are ethics something you can build into machines? And when you look at that question, you might start to look at some top-down approaches, building an ethical theory into a system, or a bottom-up approach where, like you learned as a child about what's right and wrong, the machine also goes through such a learning process. Or perhaps we might have hybrid machines with both top-down and bottom-up approaches. But when you look at this challenge, you start to become aware of something secondary in all decision-making and moral decision-making. And that's, that's the role of all these secondary capabilities, emotions, being social animals and aware of social traditions, being embodied, being a physical being in a world with other physical beings, a theory of mind, an ability to deduce the intentions and desires of those you interact with, empathy, consciousness, understanding, all these things that have been taken for granted when we have looked at human decision making when you start looking at a machine, you realize these things can't be taken for granted because sometimes they are essential for certain concepts of decisions and they have to be built into the machines also. So all of this raises a question of whether artificial agents are going to need to emulate the full array of human faculties to function as adequate moral agents and to still in trust in their actions. Now, Actually, I'm going to jump over this section because we're running short of time, aren't we? I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to jump over. But this is about something that maybe come up in a question and answer period. This is about this recent concern being raised about whether artificial intelligence it could be really dangerous. And the concern has been set in motion by a new form of, of programming called deep learning, or a new approach to neural networks that allows them to look at massive amounts of data and we have now seen machines that are solving problems in perception and learning that previously machines were not able to, able to perform. So that has created some new concerns in, the, in that area. But let me finish up with, with two points. I'll probably run a couple minutes over time here. One is, how are we going to govern this? How are we going how, how to deal with the oversight of these new, new technologies? The problem is that emerging technologies are filled with unique challenges that we haven't encountered in the past. As mentioned, the laws and regulations lag behind development, and traditional governance models are pretty dysfunctional when you look at them in terms of some of the new challenges. So we need some new mechanisms, some new reflexive, adaptive mechanisms to govern the emerging technologies. Now this chart, if you look at it, on the left we have ways in which government gets in involved in the development of technology. So it can finance new research and therefore speed up the development of a technology. It can bring in laws and regulations to bring in oversight and slow it down, or at least say what is acceptable and what isn't. But there's also all these other mechanisms, soft governance mechanisms. So we're talking about insurance standards, codes of conduct, uh, business business standard, uh, industry standards, laboratory practices and procedures, insurance policies. There's all these different ways when we, that we can mold or shape the future development of a technology through soft governance, not just governmental hard governance. And what we're suggesting with, with our governance coordinating committees is to have issues managers that coordinate the activities of all the interesting parties, all the stakeholders 
to engage in a kind of comprehensive monitoring to flag issues and gaps and to find solutions in a robust set of available mechanisms and wherever possible to favor soft governance over high governance. And the idea is that these new bodies should be nimble, flexible, adaptive, and lean. But as with anything, there's all kinds of implementation challenges. And I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go into those right now. But the implementation challenges make us sometimes seem that it's naive to think that we can create such new complex mechanisms. But we've done it before. We've done it whenever we see the need is there. And therefore, Gary and I have proposed that we do two pilot projects in AI and robotics, artificial intelligence, robotics, and synthetic biology. And those could be done in any country. But each country is going to have their differences in their ways of approaching these new emerging technologies. And there's then going to be issues of international cooperation, the harmonization of our different approaches. And that's going to be pretty difficult because our countries have very differing values. Some countries have a precautionary principle where they say you don't move ahead with a technology unless you know how to, how to manage the things that can go wrong. Other countries say, no, let's get all the benefits we can get from the innovation, and then after the fact, when something goes wrong, we'll figure out how to handle it. That's more characteristic of the U.S. approach. But there are some new fields, such as geoengineering, which is the use of technologies to mitigate the effect of global climate change in which countries around the world have come to recognize that the technologies that can use could actually create problems just as serious as global climate change. And therefore, they are meeting in the, at the UN and trying to come up with guidelines for geoengineering. But in all of this, keep one thing in mind. Technology is very much like an economy. In fact, it's an implicit part of the economy. The technology can both stagnate and it can overheat. So a central role for public policy and law and ethics is to modulate the rate of development and deployment of emerging technology. There's some we're going to want to stimulate with investment and speed up because we see that they are going to be so beneficial and the harms are, are very limited. There are others that we may need to slow down. But in conclusion, if technological development is truly accelerating, then there's a great deal of need for foresight. So, Ansa Amida.